Super Bowl this year, and the final score. When and where will the next earthquake happen? How many days next summer will be over 90 degrees? And what day and time will COVID-19 no longer be a threat? All good questions, all without answers. We can predict or make up something that might come close to a guess or guesstimate, but the truth is, we just don't know. And we can remember all the famous predictions that told us the world was going to end on a given year, or the pastor who predicted that he knew the final day and time when it was going to end, and we watched that day come and go. So what do we do? But what do we make of this troubling passage of Scripture? Even William Barclay, one of the greatest theologians of our time, says this. Mark 13 is one of the most difficult chapters in the New Testament for the modern reader to understand. And that's because it's one of the most Jewish chapters in the Bible. From beginning to end, the thinking is in terms of Jewish history and Jewish tradition and ideas. All through it, Jesus is using categories and pictures which were very familiar to Jews of his day, but which are very strange and unknown to many modern readers. Even so, it is not possible to disregard this chapter because it is the source of many ideas about the second coming of Jesus. The difficulty about the doctrine of the second coming is that nowadays people are apt to either completely disregard it or to be so completely unbalanced about it that it becomes for them practically the only doctrine of the Christian faith. We call it end times language. The time when the earth and everything shall pass away, but Jesus' words will still be here. We jump to the book of Revelation and move the Im images into a modern day arena. And we ask, this earthquake or that tsunami, is, is that the beginning of the end? And there are all kinds of wars going on. Is that the start of the world passing away? And many other similar questions. But see what is happening here? We focus on the world and the finite. And Jesus calls us to focus on the infinite. In a sense, we look down to see what's happening on earth and to the earth, and Jesus says, look up, the action will be, and come from, the heavens. Sounds like a celestial drama that reaches its climax when the Son of Man comes in the clouds with great power and glory. Jesus is quoting words of scripture. His language is peppered with words from Daniel and Joel and Isaiah, the early prophets chosen by God to share this message of hope. Kind of an odd way of going about it, we think. But we look back from our 21st century time to when the coming of the Messiah was the only hope these people had. How can we in the modern age, with every convenience at our disposal, Living in the free from care, free from fear, free from oppression, understand a time and place where there was little freedom at all. Their temple had been destroyed. Not just a place to go to worship God, but God's holy residence was gone. The Romans had come in and conquered the area. The Greek influence was everywhere. In money, in the language everyone had to speak, and the crushing taxes that they had to, that had to be paid. Where are you going to go buy bread? From the local kosher grocery where you've always bought it? Or from the Roman grocery where you better buy it? Get what I mean? It was a whole different culture and language and time to live. How can we truly relate to these first century Jewish people? And yet we still try to be armchair prognosticators to predict the future. It's kind of like the Shroud of Turin, a long cloth with an impression of 
of a man's face and body mysteriously bonded into the fibers. Whose face is it? Many believers say it's the burial cloth of Jesus, the material he was wrapped in before being laid in the tomb. Do you believe it? Or is it just a hoax? On the one hand, to believe sets you in one category, to not believe puts you in another. Gullible or skeptical? A few years ago I read the definitive book on the Shroud of Turin. 100 scientists using the most advanced and accurate up-to-date technology examine the shroud. The results? 50 believe it is the burial cloth, 50 believe it isn't. And so what's called for here is a leap of faith. Or is that a leap of trust? And isn't that what Jesus is asking us of us here? His words ring of truth, but it also fills us with images that we're not sure we can understand or grasp. And we try so hard to predict, to jump ahead, to know before we're supposed to. And we give ear to those who claim to know the day, the time, and the moment when the world will come to pass. But Jesus clearly tells us we are not to know when. The angels don't know. Jesus himself doesn't know. Only God knows when things of the next world are to take place. Rest in that. Believe in it. God has it all taken care of. And so what an odd piece of scripture to start this journey of Advent. One year, the lectionary cycle is all about John the Baptist preparing the way of the Lord. The other two years focus on the Gospel of John and Mark's look at the end of times. What is Advent about? Preparing our hearts and lives for the coming again of the Messiah, the one who saves his people. We prepare, make ready, keep awake for that day and time. When the Son of Man will comes to create his kingdom here on earth, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. And all that is a message of hope. Hope that one day Christ the King will reign supreme. Hope that one day war and suffering will be conquered once for all time. Hope that the future will hold far better things than we can ever imagine. But there is a catch. We have to be prepared for it. How many times do we go on vacation and we ask a neighbor to wash the house for us? Jesus is reminding us that we are the ones being asked to keep watch. We are to keep awake. Be prepared for when Christ comes again. Like the Olympic runners of long ago who carried lighted torches as they ran. It wasn't so important who won the race. The true winner was the one whose torch was still lit at the end. Are you preparing? Is your torch still lit. Instead of listening to those who say the world is going to end, or to those who try to plant a seed of fear or uncertainty, let's keep our eyes and hearts focused on Jesus, the perfecter of our faith. And may this season of Advent be the time you truly watch for him.